This video has been funded by the Federation of European Neuroscience Societies. In this video, we would like to introduce you to an often unheralded perspective on Sigmund Freud, his work as a neuroscientist and a neurologist. As a matter of fact, before theorizing about unconscious cognitive and affective processes, he was one of many forgotten pioneers in neurobiology and neurology. A few weeks ago, we had the pleasure to meet Mark Solms. Mark Solms is a neuropsychologist and psychoanalyst. He holds the chair of neuropsychology at the University of Cape Town and is the president of the South African Psychoanalytical Association. He is also currently research chair of the International Psychoanalytical Association, director of the English re-edition of Sigmund Freud's complete works. He founded the International Neuropsychoanalysis Society in 2000, and he was a founding editor of the journal Neuropsychoanalysis. So we thought he was the best candidate to deal with this topic. Um, well, uh, first of all, Freud was not only a neurologist, but first a neuroscientist. And in fact, his neuroscientific work covered a very wide spectrum. He started out um, as a histologist, uh, trying to under understand the, or dis discern the structure of the nerve cell. And uh, that work he did in invertebrates, uh, river crayfish. Then he moved to vertebrates um, and he moved to looking at um, fiber pathways in the spinal cord and in the, um, in the brainstem. And so as he moved up toward the brainstem, he also moved uh, from invertebrates to vertebrates to human beings. He started to study human fetuses, a very interesting method that, uh, that they were using at that time that was pioneered by Flexic. And then he became a neurologist after doing some important work on the anatomy of the brainstem. Uh, and started making uh, uh, contributions to clinical neurology, especially to pediatric, uh, to cerebral palsy, the study of uh, and classification of movement disorders in children, and ultimately to neuropsychology. Um, he, he, he made two really important works um, in neuropsychology. The one was his uh, to Auffassung uh, der Aphasien, the interpretation of the aphasias, which was published in 1891, was a critique of the um, Wernicke-Lichtheim classification and conceptualization of the aphasias. Um, he, 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 it was a, 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 a very deep uh, uh, and intelligent crit criticism of localizationism, of the need for a more dynamic conception, more of a network approach um, to uh, the cl classification of the aphasias and the understanding of the brain mechanisms of language. That laid the foundations for uh, dynamic neuropsychological views that came later, uh, like, for example, um, uh, Alexander Romanovich Luria. Uh, his approach was very much in the tradition of Freud. There's an interesting thing about Luria, which is that he was, uh, in his youth, uh, he was not a psychoanalyst uh, because there was no psychoanalytic training in Russia at that time, but he was a member of the Moscow Psychoanalytical Society. In fact, he was the secretary of the, of the society. And before that, he was the president of the Kazan Psychoanalytical Society, which is a far eastern city in Russia. And he wrote to Freud when he founded that society. And so there was a very small correspondence between um, Luria and Freud. And it's clear that Luria was deeply um, imbued with psychodynamic ways of thinking. Um, he, he was very much involved in the scientific life of the Moscow Psychoanalytical Society until the early 1930s. All of a sudden, Luria writes, psychoanalysis is a bourgeois science. Uh, psychoanalysis reduces uh, complex social uh, uh, historical uh, processes to biology and um, he resigns from the Moscow Psychoanalytical Society. And that is only because of politics. It became um, frankly dangerous to your life uh, if you were a supporter of psychoanalysis by the 1930s when Stalin decided that psychoanalysis was scientia non grata. And so it was a, it was a public mea culpa by Luria in order to be able to literally survive. Uh, 
Um, but if you follow the ideas in uh, Luria's whole approach to neuropsychology, it was very dynamic, it was very uh, uh, steeped in s uh, psychoanalytical ways of thinking and psychoanalytical ways of working. The whole approach to neuropsychological evaluation of Luria is a flexible, individualized, clinical approach as opposed to the American approach of standardized batteries of tests and measurement and so on. There was a funny trick. There was a book called The Great Soviet Encyclopedia and uh, Luria wrote the entry in that cy encyclopedia about psychoanalysis. And the opening sentences are something like, psychoanalysis is a bourgeois science, blah, 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 but this is what they say. And then he writes this beautiful, sophisticated analysis of, uh, of psychoanalytical ideas. But you first have to say that they're bourgeois, then you can say them afterwards. <laughs> the other um, great contribution was his project for a scientific psychology. Although it was never published at that time, it was only published in 1950, it was a remarkable synthesis, um, way ahead of its time, uh, because it, it, it incorporated not only cognition, perception, um, uh, uh, learning, um, consciousness, but also affect, motivation. Um, it was a truly integrated conceptualization of the brain of the kind that we are only now, again, a hundred years later, uh, beginning to try to, um, to, to develop. Uh, there were several ideas in the project which were truly prescient. Um, one of them was the concept of a synapse. Uh, Sherrington had not yet described the synapse. This was in 1895. Uh, Freud called them uh, uh, contact barriers. Uh, he conceptualized there being a gap between the neurons. He thought that this gap was important for where learning mechanisms occur, memory. And um, in that sense, he, he presaged not only the synapse concept, but also Hebbian learning. The concept of neurons that fire together, wire together, it's there in 1895. Hebb's book was published in 1949, uh, The Organization of Behavior. Um, the, the idea of how cognition relates to affect, uh, Freud said in the project that the brain is a sympathetic ganglion um, and that, um, in other words, that cognitive processes operate in sympathy with the demands of the body uh, upon the mental instrument to perform work. So it was, a, a, I think, a few would disagree that Freud's greatest contribution to neuroscience uh, was the project for a scientific psychology. Um, well, uh, many people say so. Um, Brazier, in her, uh, Mary Brazier, in her History of Neurophysiology, she accredits Freud uh, uh, as being a pioneer of the neuron theory. Uh, there's a book by Shepard, was published in the 1990s. The title of the book is The Neuron Theory, and there's a whole chapter on Freud's contribution. I have to say, I think that Freud's contribution was not so great uh, to the development of the neuron theory. If you actually look at the papers that he wrote on the topic, the thing that he was most concerned with was the continuity between the cell body and the cell process. In other words, what we would now uh, uh, call the axon uh, and, the, and the nucleus of the, the, the cell body of the, uh, of the neuron. Uh, at the time that Freud was working in the field, it wasn't even clear whether the, what they called the fibers uh, connecting the nerve cells and the nerve cells themselves, they weren't, it wasn't even clear that that was a structural and functional unit. Certainly Freud recognized that the cell body and the axon is a functional unit. What he did not at that time in those papers, um, those histological papers, he did not have any conception of the synapse at that point. So um, the crucial issue in the neuron theory is not that the cell body and the axon and of course the dendrites are a single unit but that they there is a discontinuity between each neuron freud didn't show any uh, awareness of uh, that in his histological papers although as i said in his later project and that was 10 years later in his 1895 project at that point he clearly did understand uh, or, or, or anticipate the concept of a synapse, but it was based on theoretical considerations. It was not based on histological observations of his own. Mm -hmm.
Chaco um, was an enormous influence on Freud. People don't, I think many people don't realize um, that the reason that Freud went to study under Chaco was not because he wanted to learn about hysteria or hypnosis. Uh, it, was, it was because he wanted to learn the clinico-pathological method of Charcot. Um, at that time in the 1880s, there were two major schools of neurology. There was the German-speaking school, um, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Austria, and, and, and German um, approach was very theoretical and very reductionist. Um, the, like uh, the Wernicke Lichtheim theory of language, it was highly theoretical based on uh, conceptions of brain centers and association pathways, which were largely fictional. You know, um, nowadays people speak of that as brain mythology, uh, that they had ideas derived from philosophy of mind, actually. Charcot's approach was much less theoretical, much less reductionistic, much more clinical and descriptive. Uh, Charcot's view was that um, all that one has to do is to carefully observe and describe and differentiate between different clinical presentations during life. Then you wait uh, for the death of the patient at autopsy, you make equally detailed observations on the pathology and you relate the clinical condition to the underlying pathology. This was his approach. And uh, Freud said in the letter that he wrote when he applied for the travel grant, which was what brought him to Paris, he got a, 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 a bursary to study uh, under Charcot. He said that's what he wants to study under Charcot for. He says he's learned everything that there is to learn from the German approach. Now he wants to study the French approach. And um, I think that that was the single most important influence that Charcot had on Freud. Because when it comes to the neuroses, by definition, there is no um, physiological, uh, and there's no lesion, there's no, uh, there's no physiological abnormality. The approach of taking a purely clinical observational perspective uh, that Charcot Im imparted to Freud as a neurologist, uh, that same perspective that uh, Charcot took uh, in relation to amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and multiple sclerosis and so on, he could use exactly the same approach in describing neurotic conditions. Whereas in Germany, uh, if there's no physiology, no pathophysiology, then there's no disease. Terror is another name for lying. Peter, there's no therapy for that. You will see to it personally, Herr Freud. This bed is located at once. That clinical descriptive approach of Charcot was what enabled Freud to make that transition. It so happened that at that time Charcot was himself applying his method to the study of hysteria and, 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 uh, and uh, hypnosis of course was part of that. Um, so Freud became interested in those topics secondarily. I think that uh, that was a consequence of the clinical descriptive approach of Charcot. So uh, the reason that Freud gave in his application as to why he wants to study under Charcot is also, I think, um, the, the reason why Charcot had such an enormous influence on him. Neuropsychoanalysis is, I think, the natural um, development of psychoanalysis. If you look at the origins of psychoanalysis, Freud was uh, a neurologist, he was a neuroscientist, um, who became interested in neuropsychology um, in the sense that he wanted to understand the lived life of the mind, which is after all the most interesting thing about the brain, what differentiates the brain from other organs. The single distinction about the brain is that it has a subjective, conscious um, um, intentionality um, these are the most interesting things about this organ. Uh, it, it's, it's absolutely remarkable. Uh, so Freud was interested in that, um, but there were no tools, there were no techniques or no methods um, in the 1890s when he was first um, developing uh, this field of trying to bring into science, to bring into natural science, things that exist in nature like feelings, like the self, like consciousness. Um, 
all of these things uh, are not only exist, but they're fascinating. They are our very identities. That's what we are. We are our feeling uh, um, sentient selves. Um, and uh, when Freud wanted to bring all of that into science, there were no physiological or anatomical, no objective natural science tools for studying uh, the, 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 these things. So he very reluctantly said the only way we can study these things is by purely psychological methods. So psychoanalysis was a development from neuropsychology or from behavioral neurology or the cognitive neuroscience of that time, such as it was. It was, a, 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 it was ironically a, a more scientific approach. It was more empirically grounded than the pure speculations, uh, which were uh, the only other because there were no observational techniques that were anatomical and physiological, you had to speculate about what were the anatomical and physiological mechanisms of the mind. And there was plenty of speculation that went on. Freud's great teacher, Theodore Meinert, was the example. It's really ridiculous uh, what fantasies he came up with about how the mind uh, is, is grounded in brain processes. Freud's view was the only way we can study these things empirically is psychologically. And so the whole of psychoanalysis was a, a, an interim approach. Uh, and Freud made this very clear. He said, for the present, we have to use purely psychological methods and, 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 uh, and concepts. Uh, but um, uh, at some point, we will have to bring this back into neuroscience. Uh, it, it really, Freud was very clear about this. He said it over and over again. One day, all of this will be rejoined with neuroscience. So um, now, in our time, since the 1980s and 1990s in particular, we started to develop technologies where we can study mental processes from their physical point of view. You know, think, for example, just of the functional neuroimaging technologies, let alone everything else that we have these days. Um, there is therefore no reason for us to say we can't study the lived uh, complexity and subtlety of the active intentional agent of the mind we can study it physiologically and anatomically and that's what neuropsychoanalysis tries to do neuropsychoanalysis is simply uh, the, the the means by which we reincorporate all of the psychological knowledge that freud uh, and his approach um, brought to us everything you can learn about the brain from the point of view of subjective methods and subjective concepts and remember what I said, the subjectivity of the brain is its most unique attribute. So it's not a small little detail to bring the lived life of the mind, as Freud conceptualized it psychologically, to bring that back into neuroscience uh, in, uh, in order for us to subject those theories to um, scrutiny and testability with um, contemporary neuroscientific methods. Uh, that's the aim of neuropsychoanalysis. So if I can just say the same thing uh, again uh, very simply, the aim of neuropsychoanalysis is, is first of all to bring the subjective agent intentional self into neuroscience on the one hand and on the other hand to bring the scientific rigor of neuroscience into psychoanalysis so that we don't have to have a dualistic conception um, of the mind and the brain uh, anymore. You know, we think in neuropsychology that we don't have a dualistic conception, that we've already brought the mind into neuroscience with neuropsychology, but really it's not true. If you look at what neuropsychology is actually about, it's more like neurobehaviorism than neuropsychology. You know, it's neuroinformation processing, or it's not actually bringing into neuroscience the real stuff of the mind that we all experience ourselves to be. That's the interesting part, that's the complex part, that's what psychoanalysis is about, and we no longer have any excuse to not bring this true, full uh, richness of the life of the mind into neuroscience. That's what neuropsychoanalysis is trying to do. Thank you.